For 50 years, one horror story has held a certain power to terrify unmatched by any other. The Exorcist, based on the 1971 novel by William Peter Blatty and directed by William Friedkin, was released to the world on December 26, 1973, and since then, the world hasn't quite been the same. The Exorcist tells the story of Reagan McNeil, a girl possessed by the ancient Assyrian demon Pazuzu, and her mother's quest to save her daughter with the help of two priests. The film elicited an extreme reaction from audiences, who lined up in droves to see it and reportedly fainted and vomited in the theaters. Critics lauded the film for its quality in character development, storytelling, and special effects, and it became the first horror movie to be nominated for Best Picture. Today, The Exorcist is celebrated as arguably the greatest horror movie of all time. The film spawned two sequels and two prequels, as well as a television series, but none of these have matched the quality or impact of the original. Currently, Blumhouse and Universal are continuing the franchise with a planned trilogy of films, which attest to the original story's continued relevance. All that said, with The Exorcist having such a storied legacy, it's easy to forget where it all started. With William Peter Blatty as an undergrad at Georgetown University, hearing about a case of alleged demonic possession. Today, I'd like to tell you that story. Maryland, January 1949. 14-year-old Ronald Edwin Hunkler began exhibiting bizarre, seemingly supernatural behavior. Until 2021, one year after his death, the public didn't know Ronald's real name, with various pseudonyms being given like Roland Doe, Robbie Mannheim, and Richard to protect his identity. Ronald didn't have any friends his own age. His Aunt Matilda, with whom he was close, was an admitted spiritualist, and she introduced Ronald to a Ouija board and showed him how to use it. Following his aunt's unexpected death, Ronald became devastated. Mysterious noises emanated throughout the Hunkler family home, like unexplained sounds of dripping water and rapping in the walls. Furniture began to move on its own accord, Ronald's bed began to shake, and ordinary objects like vases would levitate or fly. The boy's parents took him to a doctor, but nothing was found to be wrong. Ronald was merely called high-strung and sent on his way. He also saw a psychiatrist who similarly couldn't find anything wrong with him. Medicine and psychiatry having failed them, the Hunkler family turned to their Lutheran pastor, Luther Miles Schultz. Schultz agreed to see Ronald and had him spend the night at his house for observation. Upon witnessing objects and furniture moving on their own while Ronald was staying with him, as well as Ronald himself being flung around by unseen forces, he advised the boy's parents to consult a Catholic priest, since the Catholic Church, he felt, was more equipped to deal with what appeared to be demonic activity. Unlike what we see in the movies, Ronald did not receive one exorcism, but purportedly several, which occurred not on one day, but over the course of months, between February and April of 1949. Though there is no evidence for this, the story goes that Edward Hughes, a Roman Catholic priest, conducted an exorcism on Ronald at Georgetown University Hospital, a Jesuit institution. During the exorcism, the boy allegedly slipped one of his hands out of the restraints, broke a bedspring from under the mattress, and used it as a weapon, slashing the priest's arm and effectively putting a stop to the ritual. The word Lewis appeared on Ronald's skin, which Ronald's mother took to mean St. Louis, the place where Aunt Matilda had died. Taking this as some sort of sign, the Hunkler family traveled there, where they had relatives who'd take them in. Ronald's cousin contacted one of his professors at St. Louis University, Raymond J. Bishop, who in turn spoke to William S. Bowdern, an associate of St. Francis Xavier College Church and a veteran of World War II, Together, both priests visited Ronald in his relative's home. 
where they allegedly observed a shaking bed, flying objects, and the boy speaking in a guttural voice and exhibiting an aversion to anything considered sacred. Bowdern was granted permission from the archbishop to perform an exorcism, and Bishop, his assistant, was instructed to keep a daily journal to record the events. Ronald's next and final exorcism took place at Alexian Brothers Hospital, now South City Hospital, in St. Louis. The hospital was chosen because it was known for dealing with unusual cases, such as treating victims of the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages. Another priest, Walter Halloran, was called to the psychiatric wing of the hospital where Ronald was being held, where he was asked to assist Baldurn. William Van Roo, a third Jesuit priest, was also there to assist. Halloran stated that words such as evil and hell, along with other various marks, appeared on the teenager's body. Allegedly, during the Litany of the Saints portion of the exorcism ritual, the boy's mattress began to shake. Ronald became violent, breaking Halloran's nose with strength Bishop's journal describes as beyond the boy's normal ability. While Ronald was staying at the hospital, many developments in his apparent possession occurred. Father Bowdern recommended that the boy be baptized as a Catholic, which the family agreed to. Despite violent resistance from Ronald, he was baptized at the rectory of St. Francis Xavier College Church. He wasn't baptized in the church itself for fear he would desecrate it. Bowdern also attempted to give Ronald communion, but he resisted for two hours before finally receiving it. Halloran reported that when showing Ronald statues depicting the Stations of the Cross on the grounds of the White House Jesuit retreat, Ronald sped off and attempted to throw himself off a cliff, with Halloran just barely stopping him. Beginning to fear for Ronald's life, the priests asked how many demons were inside of him. At least four marks in the shape of an X, or Roman numeral 10, appeared on Roland's skin, and the priests took this to mean that their exorcism would last for ten days. The exorcism reached its climax on Easter weekend in April 1949. On Easter Monday, April 18th, Ronald woke from sleep in a fit. Father Bowdern continued once again the rite of exorcism, placing various medals and rosary around Ronald's neck and placing a crucifix in his hand. Eventually, Ronald fell asleep and woke up returned to his normal self, saying simply, He's gone. Two weeks later, he returned to Maryland and went to work for NASA for 40 years. He converted to Catholicism and had a son named Michael. Michael was named after the Archangel, whom Ronald believed was instrumental in freeing him of his possession. To this day, no one is quite sure what to make of the alleged demonic possession of Ronald Hunkler. Was he possessed by a demon or the devil himself? Was he suffering some, some serious psychological or physical disturbance? Or was he simply making up the entire episode for attention, being a boy with basically no friends, and becoming rambunctious during puberty? We can't say for sure, but regardless of what really happened in the case of Ronald Hunkler, his story is certainly a memorable one for many reasons, not least of which because it gave us the scariest movie of all time.